Now, I know I want to get you onto the vaping very soon because I know this is something you have spoken about and talked about many, many times uh, in, in papers and, and also on your Last Order Spite podcast as well. I'm going to go with something of an obsession e even for you. Uh, but in terms of these figures on, on people not able to work due to ill health, why is it growing by 300,000 a year? Um, the main reason, which is not discussed enough, is that the, the government made a mess of the um, incapacity benefit system a few years ago and uh, has essentially created perverse incentives in which uh, people are essentially discouraged from claiming short-term incapacity and encouraged to claim long-term incapacity. You get paid more for it than yeah. for short-term and also for uh, uh, unemployment benefit. The rest of Europe is not seeing anything like this. People talk about, oh, it's long COVID or yeah. it's NHS waiting lists and so on. They might play a part to some extent, but the main reason is that we've created a system which encourages people who may well be unwell, but will be able to go back to work or do some form of work yeah. uh, in the near future. We've encouraged them to go long-term sick. It's a ridiculous situation that he's looking at. Yeah, indeed. Again, people, it's one of those things that a lot of people who, who talk about these things don't understand. Actually, people uh, are actually very rational and they make, get, make sure they get on a situation where they can get the most money that is possible to have, particularly on these, on these low incomes where every penny does does make a difference um, but there's also been not much incentive for a lot of the uh, benefits uh, staff the, the job center staff to actually deal with these people they're kind of written off they're not on the unemployment statistics they're probably not on any of their target sheets a lot of those staff now doing stuff on zoom not actually working people in person and when someone's kind of written off like that they've checked in a tick box done not a problem you know they're paying out money and no one talks about them and it's only in the last year or so I know it was the spectator who kind of publicised this the first. It's actually when we say, oh, isn't it amazing? Our unemployment rate is so low. It's just got so many hidden people who are of working age who probably could work who are not working. Yeah, it's a little bit like in the 1980s, actually, where a lot of people were taken off unemployment and put onto sickness, and some of them were genuinely sick, but a lot weren't. And I think you don't need to be too suspicious to suggest that you know a, a huge rise like this has not come about as a result of natural causes, as it yeah. were. We're the, not miraculously the that much, poor, much, much iller. I mean, right. the people say there might be an element of, you know, NHS waiting list, but again, my understanding and looking at stats on that actually is that's a very small percentage. And a lot of these people also are, are young people. Um, and, then, and a lot of the things that people are claiming they are incapacitated by are difficult to verify objectively. It, we used to have backache and then it was stress. Now it's, you know, say like the long COVID, but, it, but it's also, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's various different, um, you know, uh, 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 mental health uh, illnesses. Now, there will be people who absolutely do suffer absolute debilitating impacts from these things. Uh, but there are also an awful lot of people who, frankly, an awful lot of their colleagues and their family members may think they're swinging the lead. But how do we tell the difference between them and what do we do about it? Well, that's the thing about mental health problems. You know, when you talk about things like anxiety and depression, you, you know, the doctor just has to take the person's word for it. Yeah. And, you know, the number of people who have been approved for long-term incapacity benefit has risen from 35%. Uh, 10 years ago to over 80% now. And again, there's no rational explanation for, for why that should be, particularly when there's so many more people applying. And again, look at the rest of Europe. You know, the, 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 the whole world has gone through COVID. The whole world has apparently got people who've got long COVID. There's no particular reason why we should be so much more badly affected. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing on long COVID stats, which is absolutely fascinating, is you can understand why it's more likely to be diagnosed in first world countries than, you know, uh, somewhere in South, uh, so, you know, Southern Africa. Um, however, the stats on long COVID are very, very, very clearly West Coast of America, East Coast of America and, uh, and in Southern Britain. Um, it, is ex it is absolutely extraordinary uh, how it has focused, that, that terrible, terrible impact of, long, of COVID has focused on those particular geographical areas. And I'm fascinated what the explanation for that uh, might be, but I think we all know what, it, what it, the real one is. Um, how, how do we actually deal with this, though? Because there is an element where, you know, actually, if people have got depression, have got anxiety, actually the worst thing for a lot of those people will be sitting at home, on low incomes, uh, low income on itself, low income on living on bench itself is a, is a source of great stress and anxiety and depression for a lot of people. Not working, not contributing, um, not paying into a pension, or you know, basically, or, you know, uh, unable to contribute to society, but also not having a full and rounded life. I mean, these things aren't good for people who are already unwell anyway. 
No, I think this is the, the always going to be the problem with, with disability benefit. You know, the, the range of disabilities is so broad, and you you don't want to have a big clamp down which punishes people who genuinely exactly. need the need the benefit. The trouble is that the government end up being too harsh on this, and then too soft on this. Uh, the last government, I mean, and um, ended up just making it far too easy, not just too easy to, to claim these benefits, but as I said, to, to give people more benefit. Yeah. What we need to do, the basic solution is to give people more money if they want to be off short-term sick. You don't want to be pushing people who are short-term sick onto long-term sick, because once you've said, I'm long-term sick, you can't suddenly turn around and say, actually, I feel better now, really, you know? Yeah. So you've got this horrible incentive um, to you know, get, get people to be off work potentially yeah. the rest of their lives when they don't need to be. And if you look up something like post-viral um, uh, fatigue, you know, which is basically long COVID, you look that up on the NHS website, it just repeatedly says, don't go to work, don't go to work, don't yeah. study, don't anything. Yeah. This is not necessarily good advice. No, absolutely. I, I've said this on the show before, my mum, when she was a GP, she had uh, some people who'd come in to, uh, they'd be sort of walking to her, 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 she was one of the lead GP, but they'd, they'd walk into her, uh, her little office and they'd go, oh, it's you. I've been sending to see the GP to get a sick note. And um, you're not going to sign me off sick, are you? She's like, no, sorry. <laughs> some doctors, some doctors are signing people off for months on end without even seeing them now, which is they have no reason not to. What, what reason do they have not to? Yeah, it's exactly. Get an argument otherwise. Exactly. Let's talk about vaping. Let's talk about that issue though, because uh, the latest data on vaping uh, has been produced, and it uh, says that uh, about one million people in England have never used a traditional cigarette. They've never actually smoked, but they are vaping. This has been a massive increase in recent years. Now, you have exposed so many of the stats that have put out as like, oh, a terrible public health disaster in recent years. So is this a stat we should be worried about? Is this a stat that's even accurate? This is a good news story that's been presented as a bad news story. I mean, the real story here is a massive decline in the smoking rate, and particularly amongst young adults, 18 to 24 year olds. Since 2011, the smoking rate amongst that age group has dropped from more than a quarter to less than a tenth. Yeah. This is extraordinary, and it would not have happened without vaping. Now, it is certainly true that lots of people like myself have given up smoking by taking up vaping. It is also almost certainly true, just using basic common sense, that a lot of people who would have smoked, and these are gonna be younger people, obviously, are vaping instead mm -hmm. and from the way some people talk about this you think it would be okay if these people started smoking for a few years and then quit using vaping that's all right that's what's vaping for but using it as essentially as a prophylactic seems to be a bad, be a bad yeah. thing we're talking about 1.2 percent of the adult population who have never smoked are vaping on a regular basis that is actually i think surprisingly yeah. small and but the, also as you the, say they may well have actually taken up smoking the have. idea is that they wouldn't have done anything they wouldn't they would never have tried this but i mean the the, the I don't know there, there is a, there is a certain level of, of hysteria about vaping where you know our NHS was relatively sane compared to other health services and health advisors around the world in terms of I mean America have completely lost their minds about vaping it is it is not a good thing it's not a it's not healthy for you but my God it's so much better for you than cigarettes that it's an it's an absolute no brainer that we should be encouraging vaping over cigarettes and who's to say those people would never have actually tried cigarettes in the first place. Well, it's, it's certain, let's face it, that a lot of those people would have tried smoking. Kids have always tried smoking. Young people have always tried smoking. Um, it, there's no reason other than vaping to think that that would suddenly change. Compare, you mentioned the rest of the world. You know, look at the rest of Europe where vaping hasn't been treated in such a sympathetic way. It's been the great success story in public health over the last 10 years or so in Britain. The, the, we've had public health agencies have been sensible about vaping. We've so far regulated it in a sensible way. We have a smoking rate of less than 12%. Yeah. In the rest of the EU, it's well over 20%. Yeah, it's one of the things you really notice actually when you travel in Europe is just how many people are, are smoking just because you're so used to in Britain not being around uh, mm. that smoking but this is part of the whole sort of public health hysteria isn't it and again these arguments we constantly have about you know anything that you do that isn't good for your health um, the, the state has a right to try and control to stop to to punish because you're impacting the, the, the state's finances or the NHS and its its ability to treat other patients. Now we've got this still post-COVID, this duty of care to protect the NHS rather than the other way around. Yeah, I mean that seems to be very explicitly what Keir Starmer and West Street are saying these days and that they've used that to justify potentially banning smoking in beer gardens, they're using it for the um, the resurrection of Rishi Sunak's weird prohibition of yeah. tobacco, the idea that you know the, the, pu the public are there to serve the NHS, to live yes. their life in the most efficient, economically efficient way. They're actually wrong about the economics, but I won't get into that now. It's just a very worrying no, um, but it, no, but it, premise. It is worth getting, because it is this bizarre situation, actually smokers, smokers and drinkers pay far
far more into public confidence than they ever cost it all we do nhs policing anything the crucial thing also smokers very sweetly do is they do die early they claim less of their pension uh, which is the, the, but also this idea that if we didn't smoke we didn't drink and we never had a kebab for dinner that we miraculously would live forever and never cost the nhs anything yeah, and there's also the point that people actually live to enjoy their life, not just to make their life as long as possible. No, really? As cheap really? as possible for the, for the NHS. We're allowed to have people, a quality of life. No one's... Well, we're allowed to, like, I don't know, go to Taylor Swift concerts and things like that. <laughs> uh, well, quite. And, you know... I mean, this, this, his theory about vaping, he's, partly it's just a moral thing. You know, people yeah. should be very, very happy for the reasons I've explained that smoking's gone down and that vaping has played the, the biggest part in that. But you just get people now going, oh, I don't think non-smokers should be vaping. Well, why not? What's, yeah, what's, 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 what's your, it got to do your with business? you? Yeah, but then, these, we're talking about adults here. Yeah, I'm not but, a favourite But then they link vaping. it with, then they get confused with littering as well. That's a bizarre thing. Chris, the fact that they uh, they managed to get you off cigarettes, I thought was an absolute miracle. They are miracle products. Uh, Chris, it's always so good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Indeed, for Jodie's Claire Pearson, where are you on this? Because you worked in that nanny state government. It's got even worse now under Labour. I was going to say, it wasn't a nanny state government when I was in it. We were relatively good. But um, mm. it's, it's to the end of the Conservative government, they wanted to ban everything. We know Labour like to ban things. It's and literally what they get, up, they get excited about in the morning, it's how, isn't it? It's why they get up in the morning. How can we make people's lives more miserable? But again, this idea that it's our job now is just to sort of be healthy for the state. You be healthy no. for yourself, for your family, exactly. for your loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. But again, this idea that we won't die of anything we will die of something and at some point at some point we're going to cost the nhs money i mean, of course. I, I think it's up to us to choose what it is we die of yeah